Emergency responders were scrambling on Tuesday to find out how many people remain missing after floods caused uh, water to burst through a dam in eastern Sudan. Reuters report that the collapse of the Arba Dam on Sunday killed 30 people and likely dozens more. UN spokesperson Stefan Dujaric briefed reporters on Tuesday. Regarding the floods and the collapse of the Arba Dam near Port Sudan, our humanitarian colleagues tell us that according to local authorities, 30 people have died, but our humanitarian colleagues fear the number of casualties could be much higher, taking into consideration that many more people are missing or displaced. Local authorities tell us that 70 villages around the dam have been impacted, 20 of those villages destroyed, while 70 schools have been damaged or destroyed, and thousands of animals are missing. Some 50,000 people are living on western side of the dam, have had their homes destroyed or damaged, and people urgently need water, food, shelter, and assistance. That is, of course, according to the authorities. The extent of the impact on the eastern banks is still needs to be assessed. As road has been cut off, local rescue teams are attempting to open these roads. An interagency team led by OCHA has been deployed to the impacted areas. The team is coordinating with partners and the authorities will support the assessment to further determine the extent of the damage and people's most urgent humanitarian needs. The team will also help to coordinate the response, which is being led by the government. The damage at the dam is expected to have wider consequences as it is the primary source of fresh water for Port Sudan and will impact water supplies there. Since the onset of the rains in June, floods have wreaked havoc across many parts of Sudan, with the most affected states being in north and west Darfur and the River Nile states. Before the dam collapsed on Sunday, more than 310,000 people have been impacted by flood across the country, where we don't need to remind you there is a conflict going on. That was UN spokesperson Stefan Dujaric. Uganda's top opposition party, the Forum for Democratic Change, FDC, has split into two factions, one led by five-time president, presidential candidate Chisa Besiji. The other faction is led by Patrick Amurai. As Mugumi Davis Rakarinji reports from Kampala, Besiji's new faction is called the People's Front for Freedom Party. Freedom for all. All for freedom. All for freedom. Freedom for all. Hello. Hello. Those were former members of Uganda's opposition, FDC party, chanting slogans for the new party in Kampala on Tuesday. New party member, Kenneth Joffle Opoka, claims the People's Front for Freedom has the backing of all Ugandans. The name of a new political vehicle that can transform this nation is people front for freedom uh when you go to the village in all villages in uganda there's a phone so our symbol will be phone so that now you can call and say where are you hello and that will. and then uh, our slogan is freedom for all and all for freedom because we have been in captivity for a long time and i think it is time to get out of uh, of the camp most members of the new party are from the fdc disagreements started some time ago over money allocations and mistrust between its members. John Chikonyogo, the spokesperson of the FDC, welcomed his former comrades' move to form a new party. Now that they have signed their own party, I think they have time to concentrate on fighting the common enemy to both of us, the NRM government, and we continue from different directions. Instead of wasting all the time fighting each other, and we don't even talk about the issues that concern the people of Uganda. It is not the first time former FDC top leaders have formed a new party or joined the ruling government. Both the Speaker and the Deputy Speaker of Parliament were recruited from the opposition party. The Inspectorate of the government is headed by former member Bet Kamya. Former party leader Mujisha Muntu started his own party, the Alliance for Transformation. Former FDC mobilizer Ingrid Tulinawe says new members have enough experience to galvanize public support and make the new party a force to reckon with. We are going to traverse all this country, especially we withdraw the cards, the materials that we had given them previously. We will be issuing new cards, new materials, new hope. We are refreshing, we are reloading, we are refocusing, we are moving forward. The electoral commission is expected to give the new party a green light in the coming days after determining 
whether the members have met all legal requirements for forming a new party. For VOA News, I am Mugume Davis Rakari. The murder trial of the late Henry Katanga continued on Wednesday as forensic scientist Andrew Kizimura Mobilu presented forensic evidence to the court, drawing both praise and scrutiny from the defense and prosecution teams. Mobilu, a senior forensic expert, provided a comprehensive breakdown of DNA profiles corrected from various exhibits linked to the crime scene. He explained that the DNA evidence was classified into profiles from single and mixed sources with a focus on two key individuals, Mori Katanga, the suspect, and the deceased Henry Katanga. Mobilu testified that several specimens corrected from the crime scene matched a single female DNA profile, which he attributed to Mori Katanga. The evidence of these profiles is a billion times more likely if the suspect Mori Katanga is the donor of the DNA profiles as opposed to an untested or unrelated individual from the Ugandan population. The experts cited specific specimens, including swabs from the left and right hands of Mori Katanga, cuts from the Kora area of address, and blood swabs from various locations within the master bedroom. These specimens, according to Mobilu, strongly implicated Mori Katanga as a key contributor to the DNA found at the scene of Henry Katanga's murder last year. Additionally, Mobilu highlighted DNA evidence attributed to the deceased Henry Katanga. He testified that several specimens, including stained bed covers, a pair of shorts, and a bed sheet, were a billion times more likely to have originated from Henry Katanga rather than any unrelated individual from the Ugandan population. Mixed DNA profiles and disputed evidence. The forensic expert also discussed mixed DNA profiles where at least two contributors were identified. One significant finding was from a swab of the pistol magazine where the DNA of the deceased Maury Katanga and another suspect Patricia Kakwanzi were all detected. Mobilo said that it's a billion times more likely to observe this mixed DNA profile if the major contributor is Mori Katanga and the minor contributors are the deceased Henry Katanga and Patricia Kakwanzi. However, the defense team led by Elson Kaluhangu raised concerns about the chain of custody for the exhibits. Kaluanga urged that Mobilu could not adequately account for the handling of the evidence before it reached him, suggesting that the integrity of the chain of custody was compromised. The chain of integrity can't be ensured from the end of the chain, he asserted. The defense further questioned the validity of the DNA analysis, pointing out that the preliminary reports and validation studies referenced by Mobilu had not been shared with them. He said he can't tell us that the prosecution came to a conclusion using preliminary reports that he hasn't shared. In response, Chief State Attorney Samali Wakoli defended the forensic evidence, asserting that the witness was the custodian of the exhibits and that he had properly handled and sealed them before returning them to the forensic getaway. Wakoli also content contended that the defense was attempting to undermine credible evidence that clearly linked the suspects to the crime scene.